Hello friends, this is Enda Scal, and you are listening to Inside the Banjoverse. If you're new, you're very welcome, and if not, welcome back. A big shout out to my supporters on Patreon. They are Kevin, Robert, Anthony, Christine, Colleen, Amy, Kevin, Chrissy, Samiko, and Rachel. I had to read them out, they're on the screen. Thank you. If you want to support the podcast, do please go to Patreon forward slash Enda Scahill Banjo. My guest on the podcast is Brian McGrath, a banjo player and piano player of great renown in Ireland, involved in some of the greatest bands in Irish music in recent times, such as Four Men and a Dog, Dervish and De Danon. And I do hope that you enjoy this conversation with the great Brian McGrath. Yeah, no bother. Just talk away. <laughs> Just talk away. See what happens. Yeah. Where are you from? I'm from County Fermanagh. I'm from a little place called Brookborough. And Brookborough's probably famous for two things. Uh, Number one, Lord Brookborough, who would have been the, uh, I suppose, the first Prime Minister up there. And the other thing that Brookborough's famous for, it's the village where Sean South was shot. Sean South's from Gary Owen. Okay. And a small little village, three or four hundred people. Um, Give me a bit of history on Sean South. Is that was that his name? Sean South from Gary Owen. You know the song, yeah, that everybody sings and plays. Sean South was, a, I suppose, a, a young um, IRA man, and at that time in the fifties, um, they had these what they called flying columns who used to go around different units uh, attacking, I suppose, various British, um, you know. Um, police barracks and various places like that, businesses and etc. But anyway, um, it happened one night in our village. I wasn't around. It was in the uh, mid-50s. My mother was around. And this uh, squad came to attack the police station. But Sean South was shot in the operation. And they had to hastily make their way to the border. And I'm only, where I come from, we're only maybe 15 minutes from the Monaghan border. So uh, there were six or seven or eight of them maybe, and um, one or two of them had been injured, but they left. They had to leave Sean South behind because he was so badly injured. And in those days, and this would have been the 50s, you know, there was no phones or, you know, it was pitch dark, traveling over land at night with no lights. They were trying to get from one country to another, from the north to the south, with nothing, only a compass. Uh, yeah, so, and sadly, they had to leave one other uh, injured uh, party behind them. Um, and that's what happened. It was on a New Year's Eve. Um, it was a very famous attack that I suppose went wrong. Um, and uh, everybody talks about it to this day. So that's really, I suppose, the history of it. It didn't make much difference to us as children growing up. Um, the tiny village of Brookport itself would be a would be a Protestant little village, you know, um, and the surrounding area, I suppose, would have been uh, Catholic, you know, the countryside, etc. And uh, I grew up above a pub, and um, we would have had music, local musicians in the pub at the weekends, but we also would have had visiting musicians, and I suppose that's where I would have started hearing music first, or would have gained any kind of interest. My mother or father didn't play, but they were hugely interested. So, um, but that's where I come from and that's what it was like. When I was growing up, of course, we were growing up in the Troubles. So it was a different kind of a time and there wasn't a huge pile of travelling and um, we would be very delighted if anybody called to play in the pub rather than us. We couldn't go to, we couldn't go travelling around. Number one, we were too young and number two, it was kind of quite dangerous at the time and um, it wasn't really, I suppose, the safest of things to be having sessions in pubs. Um, you wouldn't know what might happen. So, you know, we did it in our pub and loads of other pubs did it. Um, and people, you know, music was scarce. So you would have people from County Tyrone or County Monaghan or County Derry coming down to our place. You know, a big drive at the weekend, Friday or Saturday night, maybe an hour and a half, two hours drive. People would come to play music. Uh, so that's really, um, I suppose, how it all started in that area for me. For Mana, of course, is like, um, as, as a friend of mine said, it was like uh, 
the Doolin before the Germans discovered it. You know, it was a, <laughs> a hidden little kind of <laughs> uh, part of the world where we played our own music and we had our own musicians and played our own tunes in our own style. Um, so, yeah, it was a very interesting time growing up there, really. What was your what's your vibe on like being some be, be, growing up as an Irish musician living in the border area? Was there an awareness that it was a southern music? Now that's not me that's saying that. I'm thinking of other people that I've spoken to who would have thought, well, I'm kind of the Irish traditional musician that's living in essentially a different kind of country. Was there was am I is that am I have have I got uh, that all wrong or is that? Oh uh, yeah. Um we knew we came from a different place and we knew that when we crossed the border we were in a different place but I guess also um, you know we were young and uh, and um, I'll tell you a funny thing when during the Troubles there were no flas in Northern Ireland so if we wanted to enter the fla we had to go to the nearest southern county so we'd be going to Cavan or Leitrim or Monaghan to enter in the fla so we would have met other musicians from those areas, but they would have been the same age as us. Um, and they probably knew as little about the politics of the situation as we did. So for me, that never really, nothing like that ever come into it. We knew we were going to a different place and we used to love, there was nothing we loved more than coming down to say Galway at the weekend because we knew the people were different or we thought the people were different. They were more laid back. Um, the whole atmosphere was much more laid back, you know, drinking and playing. And we just didn't have that where we came from. Any big towns didn't have, you know, a huge amount of sessions in pubs. I mean, the big town near us was Enniskillen. I don't even know if they had one session. And, you know, in all the years I was growing up as a child. But I certainly didn't notice anything different about uh, going to another country. I know people, I know Irish people who were born in England who discover that uh, maybe not in a very nice way or in a very fair way. Sometimes that people might say, oh, well, you're, you know, the English ones. When in fact, these people are Irish people they just happen to be born somewhere else, you know. Mm. Uh, but I certainly didn't uh, get any kind of negative or bad vibes about that. I often thought about it myself, just, you know, in my own personal thoughts, maybe driving or being on a bus or something, thinking, you know, about where I was going or whatever, but never, never really bothered me and never bothered any of the people that I played music with either. We just kind of thought of it as a, another place to go to play music, mm. if you like. Where did the music come from for you? For me, it came from, uh, as I say, my mother and father didn't play music, but we did grow up above a pub and we had a piano in the house. Um a proper upright piano in the living room. And uh, I had an uncle, he was a priest in Glasgow, and he used to send home stuff. He used to send home parcels and clothes and little bicycles. And, but he all he sent a, a record player, uh, and we had a gramophone in the house. So I used to spend a lot of my time listening to people like uh, Winifred At- Atwell and... Tex Ritter and all these country and western albums and I was a huge Winifred Atwell fan. She was a great boogie woogie player. Um, I was into, you know, people like Jerry Lee Lewis, Bill Haley and the Comets. Um, all that kind of stuff. Wasn't really listening to any Irish tradition music, but Irish tradition music was being played all the time in my kind of life or in my growing up um, situation at home. Uh, and as I say, with visiting musicians and stuff, I wanted to play, started to play the accordion uh, and started to tinker around on the piano. And eventually, you know, these musicians want accompaniment or they want backing. Here, you sit down over there and accompany me. And you're thrown in kind of as a very young person, not really knowing any of the tunes, not knowing how to accompany, not knowing anything like that. And just learning like that. Um, I didn't start playing the banjo till I was about 15. Um this young fella called Cahill Hayden he used to come to our house, his father used to bring him. And Cahill was the first person I ever saw playing a banjo. I had heard a banjo on the radio. I'd heard, uh, you know, Liam Farrell 
on this cultist record and Mick O'Connor and this cultist record that you would hear on the radio and I heard um, Barney McKenna, but that was it. There was, there was no other banjo playing to hear. It was only in later years we discovered that people like the Flanagan Brothers had a banjo player, etc. And I'm sure there were other banjo players, but we hadn't heard of them. They were the only people we'd heard of. So, And I just found it hugely exciting as a, maybe a, a 12-year-old and Cahill was maybe a 14-year-old or something like that. I just found it hugely exciting watching this man play this instrument um, and immediately wanted to try that and um, kind of became friends with Cahill like as we were kids and teenagers growing up and he was always hanging around our house and playing music and with one or two other friends as well and he was trying to get himself I suppose more into the fiddle. He'd always tried a bit of fiddle, but he was trying to get more into it. And he gave me his banjo just for a couple of weeks. And I tried messing around on that. And then another friend of mine gave me a banjo to kind of, you know, to have for a while. And uh, really, that's how it started for me, meeting the musicians in the pub, listening to all sorts of varied music. Um, and then meeting um, the first banjo player I'd ever saw, you know. Uh, and as I say, it was a hugely exciting thing. All we'd ever seen, like, was guys playing red polished sopranos or, <laughs> you know, dirty fiddles. Or so I saw this lad, like, and he'd no, he no case. He was so small. He used to trail it <laughs> on the ground behind him. You know, this beautiful Windsor banjo. Um, I always remember that. Did but you get Did you get any lessons on it, or did you just try no? It? I never got one lesson. Uh, I sat at home tried to figure out how to hold the plectrum, tried to figure out where the notes were. I think I had enough sense at the time because I had been playing a bit of music. I had enough sense to try and figure out if I could figure a scale or two because I know tunes, then I'll be able to put something together in my head. You know, like a you know, simple <laughs> jig or something like uh, the rambling pitch bar. You know, I could figure out these first four notes and then I was doing it all down, you know, and then I was saying, oh, I have to do it down and up. And, you know, just to, uh, And nowadays we have all these people who tell you what to do and how to hold it and where to put your hand. And, you know, there was just none of that. Like, and they were, you know, they were big, rough. The first banjo my father bought me was a, a five string, you know. <laughs> 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 and I had four strings on it, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, there was no learning and there was nobody to teach you how to play the banjo. Somebody could teach you how to play the fiddle. And we knew it was tuned the same, but that's all we knew. <laughs> um, it was just a matter of foostering along and getting it wrong and getting bad looks from other people in sessions, you know, <laughs> as a child or a te an early teenager. And perseverance, you know, of course, was a big thing as well. You have to keep at it. And uh, I don't know why, but for some reason, I was hugely interested in music. So I wanted to play music. So many other people like me, I suppose, would have stopped. Um, but I, I was just so interested in it and so interested in listening to it. And I just wanted to keep doing it. And I've been keeping doing it ever since. So when did it become a career? Um, well, uh, I started playing little gigs with Cal, the two of us, um, just around local pubs. And we had a car. Cal had a car. And uh, we were able to drive to various different places, um, maybe Belfast even, or maybe a gig in Dublin. And these would have been small gigs that a really, really great person helped us a lot with when we were young fellas. That was a man called Artie McGlynn. Artie had these gigs with different people. And I remember at that stage, there used to be a, what they called a traditional night in Slatteries in Dublin, upstairs in Slatteries. And Artie got a I suppose he was asked to do a gig, but he asked me and Cahill to do it with him. So it was a huge thing for us to travel down to Dublin to do this gig and nervous, you know. And Was Artie renowned at that stage? Artie was playing with Van Morrison at that stage. <laughs> okay. uh, it was a huge deal then. It was yeah, massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're going off with Artie like to play in Dublin, you know. Um, he was the MD with Fan at the time. And uh, I think he'd made his... Uh, his guitar album, the traditional album at around that time. So he was a kind of a, a huge name, I suppose, in that folk and traditional circle at that time. So it was a big thing for us. Uh, so we started things like that. No, um, that's what happened. We started doing little gigs like that. John Campbell came along and we started doing, you know, we tried to 
figure out one or two very simple arrangements for songs and stuff like that there with banjo and fiddle. I was probably messing about with a bit of mandolin as well at that time. And um, But, you know, I was working as well. I'd got a job in the... Uh, I hadn't done too well at school. And uh, I got a job in the civil service as a clerical assistant. You know, kind of <laughs> letters and yeah. files. And I just hated it, like, and I was going away every weekend and didn't want to come back. And Then I went to America for a while. I was living in America, and then I kind of got into... Started becoming interested in bluegrass over there, and there was a band. I was in Chicago, and there was a band called the Special Consensus, who were kind of they were actually an up and coming mm -hmm. band at that time. And they used to do a thing, and I'd never heard of this until I went to America. It was a thing called an open mic night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'd never heard of that. Like, and this guy says, "Come on, we're going to this open mic night with the Special C," as he used to call them. So I went up and got introduced to these lads and of course they got me up to play a few, you know, on my old four string leg and then I got into it and started doing a few songs with them. I used to go up every week. Then I got a few gigs with them. Then I bought a mandolin and got into that. And then one night, out of the blue, Hayden rang, you know. Uh, I was in a pub in Chicago and he rang the bar and he says, I'm starting a band. <laughs> <laughs> so I immediately came home. But when I came home, and uh, uh, I ended up playing in Dervish. I started playing in Dervish. When I came back from America, I did not know Kathy that. Kathy Jordan had just joined the band. Right. And Martin McGinley had just left. Shane McAleer was in the band at that time. So Shane Mitchell had asked me, would I be interested in doing stuff? So I said, yeah. So I started off playing with Dervish. And I played with Dervish for about... Year and a half. Was it mostly banjo? Or all, all banjo. All banjo. Yeah, there was one or two songs, maybe a bit of piano, yeah. like you know, but it was all banjo. And um, it was about a year and a half into that, or maybe eighteen months. Hayden was kind of ready to go with his band, and he was at the stage where he had he had been thinking about various different people, and he'd thought of an accordion player, and he'd thought of Gino. He thought of Donald Murphy on the accordion and he thought of myself. And he says, I've just been doing a bit of playing with Arcady. He says, this guy, Mick Daly, uh, was playing with us. He's a good old singer. He says, we could go down to Cork and have a bit of a practice. And you never know. He says, he might be in. So we, anyway, we all drove down to Cork and down to the Spalpeen Fanuc and we stayed in Mick Daly's house and we had a great crack. And we didn't realise, but <coughs> Mick's nickname was the Black Dog uh, all around Cork. So, somebody in the pub, some bright spark in the pub, and they're thinking of a name for a band. Somebody says, why don't you call it Four Men and a Dog? <laughs> <laughs> so we thought, hmm, maybe. <laughs> and, that, and that's how the name... Because of Mick Daly. Mick was the black dog, you know. Uh, so that was it, Four Men and a Dog, and we started there, and I remember the first gig I did with Four Men and a Dog Ah, oh, the second gig. I think we did a gig in uh, a bar in Derry, Murphy's Bar in Dungiven. A kind of a practice thing, get together. And we had, uh, at that stage, Belfast Folk Festival was going. So we'd been booked to play at that. But I was playing the night before at that with Dervish. So I did that gig and it was great. And there was all sorts of talk about doing this and doing that. And, you know, and then the next night... I played with four men, the dog, and we couldn't believe the reaction that we got. And the next thing, people were asking us, will you come here and will you do this? And this record company got involved with us and wanted us to do this and that and the other. And So it all kind of happened really quickly. And then I just, I suppose, I, I wasn't sure what I was doing. But at that point, it just sounded really exciting as a young person. I wanted to play in four men, the dog. And sadly, um, I had to say goodbye to Dervish. Yeah. Uh, what year is that? That would have been 89, 90, around that time. Um, Four Men and the Dog started around that time, 1991. Mm. Uh, that first album was like groundbreaking stuff. It was, it was. And uh, if you listen to it now, it's still got some certain yeah. character. Um, music obviously has changed over the years and over the decades, especially with bands, as you know yourself. But at that time, yeah, it was certainly um, groundbreaking. I remember going to a FLA to do a Skull Eggshire, and there was a talk about Irish music. 
And I remember getting eaten alive by a particular um, traditional singer who told me that uh, my band was bastardising Irish music. <laughs> uh, so I had to stand up and tell him, look, it, I'm making a living, I says, but I can still play music if I want to. Uh, so, yeah, but look, at that's how we started, and it was groundbreaking, and we didn't do anything out of the ordinary, you know. And um, we had a couple of, I suppose, nice songs. And but it was really unusual for traditional musicians to be commercially successful. I and mean, that was one of the big issues, wasn't it? It was. That was the big issue for everyone, obviously, for decades before that. Um, and yeah, we ended up being reasonably successful. And we, we were starting out as well. Remember, and you know, when you start out, it's just not as comfortable. We, we still did gigs all over Scotland, like sleeping on floors and stuff. And I remember the first four men, the dog tour, when I came home, I owed somebody 120 quid, like after the day, you know. <laughs> um, but look at, it was great and it was exciting and it was great music and there were a great bunch of lads. We all got on really great together. We travelled everywhere together. We had loads of rows and loads of crack. Um, nothing ever too serious. We all enjoyed what we were doing. We were all very serious about what we were doing. Um, and it certainly was. We did a rap on that album. Like, I don't know of any <laughs> uh, band who played the instruments that we did ever try to rap <laughs> before. But uh, And we had great crack doing that, as you can imagine, you know. Um, and again, that album, that record was produced by Artie McGlynn and I remember, like, the week before, we met Artie and Oma, myself and Cahill, and we were talking, like, and telling him lies, like, you know, telling, oh, yeah, we've got ten sets ready. You know, we've got three, you know, <laughs> the studio booked for a week and all the rest, like, and he was producing it, you know. And uh, he, he obviously knew rightly, like, uh, when we got up there, like, you know, we, we might have had a set of jigs and a set of reels and maybe two songs, and, you know, he put it all together, like, and he kind of, okay, well, maybe we could do this here, or maybe we could do that there, or do you know this wee tune here, you know, um, I play this with Blaine, Wolf. you know, it's a lovely, and we kind of got it together, and um, we got a few guys in, we got uh, Brent McGarty come in on drums, and James Blenner Hassett come in on bass, I think that was it, really, um, we didn't get anybody else in for that album. And as you say, it was a huge success. It won Folk Roots Album of the Year in its debut year. Mm -hmm. um, we sold out of CDs at our first ever gig at Cambridge. Um, <laughs> back when CDs were CDs. Back when yeah. CDs were CDs and cassette tapes, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we were successful. Like, and See, I was uh, in 1990, I was like, I was, I was 14. Right, 15. So it was a huge deal. A mind-blowing album. Because I was the age that you were when you started playing with Carl and started doing gigs and started seeing Beyond the Red Paula Soprani. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and I'm playing the banjo and I'm, I've am i heard Jerry O'Connor, which blew my mind, and then Four Men and a Dog come along and you're like, holy God, this is amazing music. And I don't know if you probably don't realise that like at that stage, if you went to Milltown Malbay to the Willie Clancy Week... You go into the session and it was just uh, <laughs> four minute dog sets all night, yeah. one after another. Yeah, that did happen. I, I've, I, I even today I get asked to play sets from that album. You know, um, stuff that you would have, you know, yourself. Like sometimes when you record these things and then you go and tour them and and after that you kind of put these sets to bed. You know. And they mightn't come out again until somebody asks you 10 years, years later and you may not, you know, oh, I can't even play this anymore. You know, this kind of... <laughs> so, but yeah, there was, um, yeah, there was success and um, there was, you know, we'd done some lovely gigs. We did some great gigs. We shared the stage with great people. But, you know, it's like anything else. And uh, um, I got to a stage, I was doing other, I mean, I was playing a bit of piano as well. And I was getting calls from people to do, you know, like accompaniment work, like maybe do some stuff with Frankie or I remember at that time Noel Hill and I did a lot of work together. Um, and a lot of that work was in Ireland. Um, a lot of the Dannon stuff, which was later now for me, would have been out of the country all right. But I mean, it was a chance to stay. I had a young family. Um, I wasn't long married. 
um, I had a mortgage on a house um, and I'm thinking you know I can be at home here and maybe do a little bit of teaching and uh, you know, I was getting busy maybe doing recording at that time and people were asking me to play on this track and that track and I think, well, sure, I can do this at home, you know. I don't need to go to Australia or Hong Kong or anywhere. Did you like the touring? I loved it. And I just, if you asked me now, I would go tomorrow, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I still, I mean, you know, I don't do huge touring anymore. If I go anywhere now, it's probably for five days, you know. <laughs> yeah. Maybe two gigs. But you, you did long tours, did you? With, with the yeah, yeah, we did. Um, we did nearly. We did a hundred. We did one hundred and eighty gigs in a row one time before I ended up over a series of countries, like yeah. and maybe with a break or two days break in between, like and that's a lot of. Oh yeah. It's a lot of laundry, you know. <laughs> and that's probably pre. Smart, well, definitely pre smartphones and internet. And that Absolutely, stuff. there was no yeah. internet. Um, there might have been smartphones, but we weren't using them like we use them now. Um, you know, even logistics, like, I mean, you know, sat nav, like, what was oh, that? Yeah, you know, yeah. first tour I, I did was in 20, 2001, and it was MapQuest. If the thoughts of heading off on an American highway with MapQuest now know. is terrifying. <laughs> oh, I remember going to, you know, getting the boat from Larne to Stranraer and when you get off the boat to Stranraer stop at the first garage like and buy a, a map book to find out how to get the, the gig in Glasgow or somewhere <laughs> you know uh, but uh, but yeah look at that's what I did then I started playing um, I, start, I ended up playing uh, for nearly seven years with Sean Kane as a piano player and doing a bit of banjo and mandolin but essentially as a piano player uh, very different pace. A very different thing altogether, you know. Um, it was kind of, I suppose, contemporary songs and folk songs and traditional songs, you know. And a kind of, it's a kind of a different thing as well to see the likes of Four Men the Dog. You're a sideman here, you know, and you're doing a job with your bandmates here. Um, so it was a whole different kind of scenario in a band if you like for me as well mm. uh, and then after that uh, Frankie called me to see what I do some gigs with the Bannon and that was 96 97 and I stayed there until they kind of broke up you know um, and then of course we had the we had the two the Dannons for a while and, <laughs> that was um, fun, fun times Fun times for everybody, yeah. <laughs> the wrong, the wrong band advertised on the wrong poster for the wrong gig, etc., and the wrong photograph, and all this kind of stuff. Live line and Joe Duffy at one stage. Oh yeah, yeah, all that, and you know, really and truly, anybody in the band didn't want to be involved in that. Um, we were just kind of turning the radio down, like and cringing kind of thing. But look at it, this kind of stuff goes on, and. Um, I think it all ended okay in the end. So, but really, that's what I've done, you know. And I kind of, in between those times, I've done other things as well. I've I've had a great time over the last twenty five years playing music with John Carty, of course, who's a fabulous banjoist, as we know. Um, John has a band there at the Racket. Um, Another groundbreaking band and all right. in, in, yeah. in, in, a, in a totally different yeah. way again you know you haven't been in any bands that weren't groundbreaking this one, <laughs> this one I'm starting to learn here <laughs> I don't know about that but um, but yeah that was great fun as well and we did a lot of two kind of banjo stuff we didn't work out anything I guess those lads the way they played their music they played music with a very heartfelt innocence if you like and this is the way we play it, and this is the way we're going to play it, and um, we hope you like it. And that sounded good to me. Um, so we did that. We did three albums with At The Racket, um, and I totally enjoyed that. Everybody used to think that At The Racket were a band that played music from the 1920s, but we didn't, you know. We played some music from the 1920s, but we played all sorts of other music and we played new compositions, compositions of our own, new compositions of other people, you know. So we certainly didn't just play uh, music from the 1920s. No, I think it was 20s. probably the tonal quality with the saxophone. It was, and we had the saxophone, you know, and a lot of those bands would have had brass in those days just to carry. Obviously, there wouldn't have been PA or stuff, you know, like 120 years ago. 
So a lot of those bands would have had, um, I know, for instance, the Flanagans employed um, uh, Jewish klezmer musicians to arrange their songs, etc. So we had the saxophone as well. And, you know, I used to always kind of sm- smile to myself when we'd start on the stage and see the people's eyes opening when they'd hear this sax, you know. So what, what's that, you know? <laughs> And then they actually get to like it because he, he, he could actually play it, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, there seemed to be great humour in that band. Yeah, good fun, good fun band. A uh, great band, say, like for a party or a wedding band. or. But look, at, we had a very serious side about our music as well and it did come across that way and we played it that way and it was kind of, as you say, happy and jolly and kind of bouncy at times and... Um, but don't don't for one minute think that we weren't very very serious about what we were doing all the time, you know, because we were. Uh, we still do gigs, and we're still very serious about it, and we like to, you know, think about what we play and why we play it, and you know, good reasons for playing decent music, if you like. So, yeah. Do you, Do you have a business head? No. I'm a sole trader, but I don't have a business head. <laughs> um, I, yeah, so I'm curious in, in terms of like the, you know, the forward planning for the likes of Four Men and a Dog in terms of what we're going to do next year and the year after yeah. and all of that kind of stuff. Well, we didn't have to worry about that really. And we didn't have to worry about that in Dervish. Um, I guess without the racket, it was a kind of, I suppose on a smaller scale, if you like, we didn't do a huge amount of touring or we didn't even do like a huge festival circuit or anything like that. I always thought, you know, that if At The Racket had been given a chance maybe in the States playing that type of music, Mm. that something might have happened for them. But it just didn't happen for us, you know, at the time. But uh, John uh, and Maureen, John's wife, they, they looked after all that. And uh, they set up the, the 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 record label, you know, Racket Records. And so we didn't have to worry about that. I didn't have to worry about that. Um, anything that I've done on my own, I've had to worry and sit down and think about <laughs> and ask for a lot of advice because I don't really have a business head. Four Men and the Dog was the same. We had a manager, we had a record company. Um, and that all went when we kind of went from the record company and from the management, um, Cal just did that himself and still does it himself and um, again four men the dog are like that now you know there's no big touring anymore there might be the odd gig here or the odd weekend there um, and I guess time moves on and you know and people get older and some people want to do other things and some people don't want to do the same thing again and so I think you know a lot of these bands <laughs> There's always a time, isn't there? There's always a time. Um, maybe not for a band, but certainly for, uh, you know, the infantry in the band. Mm-hmm. Um, not everybody's going to stay from the word go to the bitter end, you know. Um, so personnel can change. I, I, I guess, you know, the music can change from that. But I, I, obviously, I guess as well, like a, a, essentially a band has a particular value or a particular sound that they always try to adhere to or stick to. or, um, But, you know, music is for experiment as well. And um, there, has to be, there has to be experimentation, like in music. Otherwise, <sighs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's the same 50 tunes every week. Or? Exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. you know. How far outside of the tradition have you stepped? Well, I've played in country bands, I've played in uh, rock and roll bands, I've played in pop bands. What did you play in the pop band? Uh, I played Keys. keyboards, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a Yamaha DX7. That was great for that kind of thing, you know. And I had a Roland D50, which had a great organ sound and great pads and stuff like that. So, yeah, and I used to stand up and everything, you know. <laughs> um, you won't get me standing up these days. Did you ever stand up playing the banjo? Yeah, we used to stand up all the time in Four Men the Dog and uh, at the racket. But we, when we started in Four Men the Dog, we sat down and then we thought, 
maybe we'll stand up, you know. We saw a few bands, you know, uh, on our travels. Yeah. Well, what's that? Such and such, dude, standing up, you know. And I was like, oh, aye, maybe, you know. We'll try that. And then the next thing we were standing up, you know. Uh, and uh, I don't mind it. I don't mind standing up, you know. I'm happy sitting down or standing up. It doesn't really make a huge. I mean, if the thing is comfortable on you, uh, well then... What kind of banjo do you have? Do, at you, the, at do, the, do you have many? Yeah. Um, I don't have many, no. I have five, I think. Um, at the minute, I'm playing a clarine. It's a custom clarine, um, which is, and it's actually based, the neck is based on a copy of a, a Clifford Essex banjo that I had been playing an old concert grand. So the neck is kind of copied of that. It's a kind of a mongrel banjo, really. It's got a rosewood neck that looks like a paragon. And then it's got a, 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 a maple pot. <laughs> and then it's got a rosewood resonator. So it's a kind of a mix of them. Um, and when I went in, you know, I was sitting down trying different instruments. And the guys out there were saying, yeah, you want to try this Satanta here? And you want to say, I said, no, I, I, I like this one, you know. So it was an oyster. Uh, and it was just the tonal quality that I liked. It wasn't the, you know, it was just the tone. Um, so the boys did a great job. They went and um, built a banjo around this pot. Um, and they built it in rosewood. And they copied the neck off the, uh, off the Clifford Essex. So I have, a Clifford, I have two Clifford Essex banjos. And I have, uh, I have a Gibson. And I have uh, a Clarine. And I have a Windsor, an old English. I don't know. I don't Windsor. know Windsor. I wouldn't be very familiar with Clifford Essex either. Yeah, well, Clifford Essex, they have uh, the top one would be a Paragon, and then they have like a Concert Grand, and then there's a, there's a few others. Um, I have another one. It's called a Concert. It's a Clifford Essex Clipper. It's called. Um, and they were an old English banjo, and the funny thing about them, they weren't like Gibsons or Epiphones. Every single one was different. Some of them had a big thick neck. Some of them had a thin neck. Some of them had different lengths. You know, um, some of them had no numbers on them. You know, you can guess, like, some some guy, like, working in there, his mate played in a jazz. You know, he was obviously making him a banjo. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of this yeah. with the Clifford Essex. And if you go back through the history, you know, you can see there were the Clifford Essex Company. Then there were Clifford Essex and Sons. Then there were Clifford Essex and Sons Limited. You know, and if you look at all the records, like, you can, it's the only way you can tell when your banjo <laughs> was made, you know. Um, if you look at the stamp, what does it say? Does it say Clifford Essex and Sons? Does it say Clifford Essex and whatever? Uh, so, you know, they were a totally different. But I kind of thought they, they suit our music um, because they have a kind of a rounded. I find a lot of the Gibsons and Epiphones are very bright. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe sometimes, for me, verging on thin, if you like. Uh, and I guess sometimes I, I, I like a more rounder, kind of fuller sound. It doesn't have to be a bigger banjo or anything. I just like that fuller, rounder sound. It's like, I guess, if you have a flat head or if you have an arch top, I guess it's going to be the same. It'll probably just take out you know, it'll probably take out a bit of that roundness if you had a an arse top, I guess, when that fell in was tighter. Mm. But, um, but yeah, um, I'm enjoying playing the, the clarine at the minute. Um, I think banjos need to take a little time to to give you their character, you know. Uh, and um, I probably have this now about uh, 10 or 12 years. When was the Volvo Ocean Race in Galway? That's when I... Started playing that. 2009, the first one. Yeah, yeah, that's that's when I picked up that banjo first. Um, so I have it about 13 or 14 years now. Um, it's gone back once or twice for some very minor things, but ultimately, you know, it stands to test those new instruments. Old vintage instruments are beautiful tonally and the workmanship and all the rest. Like, But that thing could be a bit slick by the time you get to New York, you know. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you open... A new one, um, I just found. I, funnily enough, I did a, a festival up in Skagen in um, Denmark, and we had a fly from Dublin to 
Germany and then we had a flight from Germany up there but my banjo got lost uh, <clears throat> and it turned up the next day uh, and I opened it and nothing was wrong with it and it was still perfectly in tune you know now if that had happened um, my old uh, concert grand like it had been in four or five bits you know yeah. I'll tell you a very funny story Artie <laughs> was over doing a tour with Patrick Street one time in America and he was flying home, and uh, Artie had a tagamine at the time. And he tuned it down, and he put it into the hold, you know, in his case. And then he arrived in Dublin, and when he got to Dublin Airport, he, oh, he saw it come out in the thing, and he went over and he cut the tape, and he opened it up, and he took it out. And the guitar was in a completely different tuning that he'd never used, you know, and perfectly in tune. <laughs> Some guy took it out and started playing it. I put it back again. Said, yeah. <laughs> he, he, he found it funny. Like, Artie thought it was brilliant, you know? <laughs> this guy, you know, took it out, tuned it like in yeah. open D or whatever Artie didn't use, you know? And it was meticulously placed back into the case and everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Um, what are you playing at the minute? I on the road I play a neckville. Oh yeah, it's a. Plectrum. Do you like those? Yeah, I love it because it's a very round tone. It's a completely different tone off it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it has loads of resonance. <coughs> now it's a plectrum length, so it's like twenty-two frets. And away, for for extra resonance. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the, it really brings out the, the round tone. It was because what we were doing with the band was, you know, there was we we'd one foot in all time kind of bluegrass music yeah. and it was yeah. just to round it out particularly because we were doing so many songs yeah and you can kind of get both tones out of it by moving your right hand around so that yeah. Was, yeah and so when I'm at home I'm playing a clarion oyster which I love and it's that it's got a frosted head so it's a little bit softer than than, than the, the clear head but then when I take out the neck fill I'm like oh I remember why I like this so much because there's such depth and resonance to the tone yeah and a great sustain mm. but the frets are ever so slightly Bigger, yeah, wider, yeah. and w- when you haven't played it for a while, then you you really you realize, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. But look, at that's why we play these things. We play what suits us, I guess, at the time, and, and changes all of the time. Because there was a time when I couldn't play anything apart from my clarion elite, and there was a time before that when I would only play my Epiphone. Yeah, I got the Epiphone completely done up uh, two years ago, and I still don't like it. Yeah, it's just well, too bright. I get sick of them, you know. I play tons. I'm telling you there, like, I love it and all that. I'll be sick of that, like, next month, and then I'll pick up the Concert Grand. And, and the tuners are kind of done on the Concert Grand, but I don't want to tune them because... I uh, change them because they're the um, old English yeah. imperial size, and I don't know if there's one that you can get to fit that, so I don't want to take away the... Um, <laughs> this is This is... I, I did the Epiphone, I did everything. I brought it down to John uh, John Meskel. Oh, yeah. Or I sent it down to him. The string doctor? Yeah. And he changed everything in it, except for the tuners. And he said, do you want to keep the original tuners? And he took them apart and cleaned them out and everything, put them back together. And I said, yeah, we've got to keep the original ones. Yeah. And I'm like, I wish I'd changed them, because it just <laughs> won't stay in tune. You know, well, I'm the same with the Clifford Essex. Yeah, I love it. And I put new strings on it, and I go out. And after three weeks, I'm just sick of trying to tune it, you know? <laughs> Pick up another one, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think it's a hard instrument? Um, I think it's a physical instrument. And we have this uh, false belief that everybody thinks you can just pick up a banjo and play it. You can pick up a banjo and you can learn how to play it very, very, very easily. But to actually play the damn thing properly, to use it to its full worth as an instrument, to get what you can out of it, it's, it's, it's no mean feat. It's, a, it's an extremely... And you see the physicality of it. Like if you play 20 notes on a bow, you know, we have to do this 20 times. Um, and it's, it's technically like, you know, getting this hand right and getting that plectrum right. I mean, eventually we'll all get our fingers up on top of the fingerboard. But it's here, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and I see so many people come to me, young people, older people, people who've been playing for 20 years and people playing for two years and you know yourself you know whatever way you're going to do it that's the way you're going to do it it's impossible nearly to change um but i think it is a hard instrument i i, I know i play one um 
and I know you play one as well, but they are a hard instrument, uh, I think, to play correctly. Um, yeah. You know, and I think as well, and we, we, we pick the things. We don't play, we don't strum them, mm -hmm. you know. So that's a whole different uh, technicality here for people. You know, am I going to rest this hand somewhere? Am I going to keep it up? Then it's hard to move the... What do I do? You know, am I interfering with the sound if I put it here? You know. <laughs> yeah. I've been doing a load of research in the last couple of weeks into picking patterns. Yeah. Because I've always been an advocate of down, up, down, alternate picking, right? And because uh, I'm teaching a few people that are trying to play faster. And so I went and I took a couple of lessons from bluegrass players in how they get their students to get over 100 BPM, which is not super fast, but they, they reckon this is the breaking down point. And so I ended up down this rabbit hole of double escape picking and down and down escape and up escape and all of this kind of thing. But all of that picking um, technique analysis is all done on guitars and electric guitars and on mandolins and their heavy picks and their yeah. and light pick strokes. And so I'm watching all these videos and they're like, hey, look at you can do this at like a million BPM. And I'm like, yeah, I could do that on guitar as well because it's, you can rest your hand on the bridge on the guitar and it yeah. doesn't affect anything. And so what I'm trying to figure out now is how to add some of those ideas to banjo because it's much harder to pick it. Yeah, it's extremely difficult to pick. And I was talking to somebody, a guitar player recently, and we were just sitting down trying to analyze this bit of work that Tony Rice had done, you know. And we were just watching his hand, and we know it's a guitar, we know it's different, it's a different instrument, like, but just the way he held it himself, like, he, he, he rested, he was very kind of, as if he didn't move at all, you know, when you watch his plectrum, when you watch him working, like, uh, and it was totally amazing to see him, and you know, all the stuff we've heard of him over the years, like, and the pace, as you say, how is it done, you know? Never misses a, a note, you know. And I washed his hand. I said, "How is he doing that? Like the way he holds his hand, you know." But uh, and I know now it's a it's a guitar, like. But it's very difficult to watch the five string players because they don't use a plectrum, you know. Yeah. So it's a whole different. <laughs> I could. It, it's way easier. That's my excuse. <laughs> well, they easier. have. I, I did talk to. Um, <coughs> uh, I can't even remember. And, and they literally said, we have three picks. You only have one. We only have one, yeah. You only have one. I don't know if you've ever watched Jake Workman. He plays guitar with Ricky Skaggs. Yeah. And if you watch his right hand, when he changes from strumming to picking to super fast picking, his hand changes position and his pick hole changes, essentially. Yeah. Like the whole thing uh, gets really small and his hand pronates. So yeah. he changes the, the trajectory of the pick. Yeah, and he was explaining this to me that this is the only way that you can do that super speed, like yeah. one eighty BPM, and he yeah. never misses a note. It's like, oh. yeah. But then yeah. it's a it's a one point two millimeter pick. <laughs> you know, it's just so different. But this is it, you know. And we use like an owl. Most people use one of those seventy threes. You know. Do you still have the same? I remember talking I have, to you yeah. ten years ago, and you're like, I have one pick, and this is it. I have it. I have it out there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I have it. Seventeen years now. <laughs> Same pick, yeah. I have bags of them, Brian. I go through, when I'm playing on tour, two picks a night. Yeah. And I used to do that in Four Men and the Dog. Yeah. But I'm using a different pick now, and I have been, it's a Herdom, and it's a thick, kind of a, I have a light touch end. Mm -hmm. I'm not heavy handed, but the pick that I use, it's not one of those triangular ones that has a different strength on each point. It's a, uh, What's that one? That's a spare one, actually. Oh, yeah. Do you put the edge on them, or does it No. Come, it comes with the edge? It comes with the edge, and then eventually it goes. It actually makes it easier around the strings, you know? That's a... Is it a 70 or an 80? It's either a medium or a hard. That's all I have. <laughs> yeah. I got, uh, I got six of those off some music shop in America. I found them online. It was $9.00. And 42 for the shipping, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That sounds about right. <laughs> so. <coughs> if you could buy any banjo in the world, do you have, or get one made, do you have 
Do you have a dream banjo? Uh, I don't, so I want to steal yours. No. No. Uh, I suppose I hear different um, banjo people talking and you know just as well as me at the minute, it's all Epiphones. Um, all the young lads are all playing Epiphones. Um, before that, it was all Clarines. Um, any nice banjos that I have picked up have always been well-known brands of instruments. They've either been a, a Clifford Essex or a Gibson or an Epiphone. Um, I've picked up and played many, many other banjos, but those are the ones that I've always tended to like when I play like a like a, in a messing situation, just play a little simple reel or a jig. You can tell action-wise, you can tell neck-wise, you can tell tone-wise that this instrument has something, mm. maybe just a little bit more or a different level. Um, um, I don't know what you call it, the Epiphone, the, uh, the Bandmaster. Okay. Um, and then there's a, is there, there's a Dragon one as well, isn't there? There's Dragon, Concert, there's all the recordings, and uh, there's a few other yeah, models. Yeah, I, I played a lovely one there recently. A, a friend of mine in Limerick bought it off a guy in England. Oh, just huge, many thousands, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a truly beautiful instrument, you know, absolutely beautiful. Um, have you played Tom Cousins' collection? I have. Yeah. Some of them are beautiful, you yeah. know. He handed me one or two one time, and three times before he handed it to me, he says, you're not having it. Mm. <laughs> and there was a couple that you would have brought home. He's got some beautiful Epiphones out there. He's got a lovely Paragon out there as well. Mm. Um, I've never seen, has he? I'm sure he has a few nice Gibsons. I've never seen any nice Gibson banjos out there. Yeah, he's a big Epiphone fan. Yeah, he yeah. is. He has the book and everything, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I liked them. I just find with the Epiphone, there's not a huge pile of... Uh, not that I'm a heavy player, but there's not a great deal of huge projection out of them. Um, like Tom sing, like it'll, it'll rattle off from, from here to my cullen, you know. Mm. But um, the Epiphone, I think it's a really, really beautiful instrument. Um, Projection-wise, it could probably have a little bit more for me. The Gibsons are absolutely stunning. I just find with the Gibsons, you need, you need to do something with their necks because they keep breaking, you know. The lovely, thin, beautiful necks like they keep breaking, you know. Um, but I certainly don't have a favourite. Um, any decent banjo, uh, I'll play it. Mm. Probably like yourself, you know. Yeah, it's all about the action for me. It's all about the action. Yeah. It's all about the action. Um, and getting that down to where you want it to be. Mm. Um some people like lovely low action and some people don't like it that low, but we can't play with high action, for instance, you know. Um, it's just too difficult. Um, yeah, the, he the low action and the heavy hitters, I think that's where it, the problems come in, yeah. 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 Um, I can play a low action banjo, no problem. I know some people can't. I was just listening there last night, you know, Hayden, you know, was, he came in there last night and he just picked up my ear and played a tune on it. Like, when I, I was playing there, like, you wouldn't hear me behind a wet newspaper, you know. <laughs> but, like, you'd have heard him up in Coley's, you know. Yeah. Really loud, like, and, you know, and you, there you go, you know, it's all out of tune, like, and everything when you get it back, <laughs> you know. <laughs> he's a phenomenal player. And he's just a phenomenal, and his plectrum hand is just phenomenal as well you yeah, know yeah. and the way he goes up to a high B he always goes with the two fingers you know oh yeah to the high B yeah um, oh he's an amazing he's an amazing banjo player like yeah he's got, a, um, he's got an unbelievable groove he has music you know and he has rhythm mm. um, a huge factor like his rhythm in our music in any music I guess and Cahill is that in abundance John Carty, another one, you know. Give him, give him any instrument that you have to play with a plaque. <laughs> yeah. And he'll do it beautifully. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. Um, Will you play something? Yeah. <laughs> 